Uh, we've been talking about tranquility versus tranquilizers, uh, and we read from Psalm 31. I'm not going to reread the psalm, I promise you. If you're tuning in, read it on your own time, but we did read scripture. We read the whole Psalm 31, uh, and then we talked about the fact that uh, stress is a fact of life. We need to prepare for it. God can help us even when that stress is our own doing, it's our own cause, and we learned in week two that much of the stress we encounter in life, it's not the devil, it's not other people, it's our own foolishness. We make mischoices, missteps, and we suffer the consequence. And uh, we get stressed out because we haven't done things the right way. Um, but even when that's the case, David said, my own iniquity has caused this, but I, I still trust in the Lord. Amen. Wonderful thing about God is this, is unlike us, when we mess up, man, we're ready to dump people. But even when we mess up, God doesn't dump us. That's good news. Amen. <laughs> uh, and so we, we, we taught a whole bunch of other things. And like I said, I'm not going to go over all those. Last week, we came right down to the kind of the, where the rubber meets the road after we established all these things about stress and all where they come from and how to deal with some of it. And what we came to is this, is that we don't need a self-help book. We don't need Pastor Mark to tell you what I do. And I might have a few tricks and I might know a few things that work for me. But you know what? What works for me may not work for you. And your stress level is different than mine. Or your stress is created by different things. So uh, we went to the greatest source we could ever go to. We went to the Lord Jesus Christ. And when we look at Jesus, boom, you got the answer. Amen? And, and so last week I said what I would do is I would show you a few character traits or a few things that Jesus did. They're not tricks. They're, they're things that he did as an ordinary part of his life. And I don't, I don't believe that, and we could debate this, but I won't, certainly not on Facebook. I'm tired of debating things on Facebook. But, uh, <laughs> so I don't want to debate it with you. But I, and I think if we debated, I would win, because so, that's usually what happens. Uh, so if I debated it with you, what I would debate is this. Is I don't think there's ever, ever, ever been a human being that lived with more stress than Jesus Christ. You have to understand something, that from a small child, he understood what his father's mission was. Uh, 12, 13 years of age and his mom and dad can't find him. So, so much for Mary being sinless and perfect. I love her, but she lost a 12-year-old. <laughs> Read the story. They're halfway back home and she's like, where's the kid? And he, the, Joseph's like, I thought you were watching him. They're like, who, who? a 12-year-old? What? We don't know where he is. Uh, they got to go all the way back. And where do they find him? They found him in the house of God. And as a 12, 13-year-old boy, he's sitting with the most learned men of the day in Scripture, and he is unraveling mysteries for them and confounding them with his knowledge of God's Word. He is the Word. <laughs> I mean, it was kind of, it wasn't cheating, but it was kind of like, you know, I don't want to tell you, I'm, I'm the guy that wrote that. Um, <laughs> it's kind of my book. Um, he, he's confounding them with his knowledge and his wisdom, and when his parents course challenge him you know it's the famous line he says you know I, I must be about my father's business I, I'm not one of these kooky new age preachers that believe that when Jesus got to Calvary he was shocked there are guys who teach that stuff no one was more shocked than Jesus to find out he would be giving his life he, he knew this he knew it before he came so I, I don't I can't even comprehend I know he was God I know he was God but he was God in the flesh he chose to unwrap from himself some of the divinity of heaven that he might put on him the mantle of the flesh. So the Bible says he was tempted and understand all things that we are tempted in and understand. So if he was totally God, that, he couldn't have done that. He, he was human and he was God. He was, he was Emmanuel. He was God with us. But he was a man. And so I, I can't... How does a 12 or 13 year old kid know one day I'm going to die? The most horrible death. And I... I not only a physical death, but I'm going to have to take on myself the sin of every human being. And he knew he was sinless. You, you think that causes a little stress? I think so. Oh, yeah. I, I know that in the garden, the third time he goes away to pray by himself, the Bible says he sweat, as it were, great drops of blood. His skin literally was pink. It, it, uh, he's bleeding, you know, with the trauma and the stress of what he's about to... And yet the Bible says, for the joy that was set before him, he marched towards Calvary. Yeah. No one took his life. He laid his life down. No one had to fight him to get on the cross. Oh, what a Savior. Hallelujah. All that stress, all the time. And on one or two occasions, 
I'm sure you could look and say, well, there's you know, a manifestation of the stress. But listen, even when he manifests anger, it's calm, it's cool. He's not, you know, he goes to the temple, you, you know, and he turns over the table of the money changers. But he doesn't, he doesn't do it like you and I would do it. Like, you know, I, I've had righteous indignation and you, you hit somebody for Jesus. It's not good. No, no, no. The Bible says he sat down and he platted. He made a whip. I don't know how long it took him, but it wasn't five minutes. He sat and he made a whip. Why? Because he's, I'm going in there and drive them puppies out of there in a minute. I got and he goes in and turns the table over. But, but even in that, what does he say? My father's house should be called a house of prayer. You, you got it all the way wrong. You got it all. He's still frustrated with humanity. Even in that, the stress of his disciples, how long am I going to be with you? And you guys, you're like on the A team and you can't get it. You're in my life group and you're not getting it. I mean, I took three of you up the mountainside. You, you saw Moses like, and you're still not getting it. I can't imagine the stress, the disappointment. And yet every time we see Jesus, he's just, he's like calm water. So he must have known something we don't know about how to handle stress. Um, and I told you I would tell you a bunch of them. So last week, and I, I said I'm not going to recap, I think it's been on the screen behind you, and I don't have time to teach it tonight. I, I said the, the point number one was identification, knowing who you are. Um, and, and so we learned that last week. It says once more Jesus addressed the crowd and he said, I am the light of the world. Eighteen times Jesus publicly identified who he was. Clearly, unequivocally, whether it upset people, whether it rattled, ruffled feathers, whether it got people all bent out of shape, or people liked him, it didn't matter. He just said who he was. And, and, and I promise you that if you can get comfortable in who you are, it will decrease your stress level. When you stop worrying about what everybody else thinks about you, and you are just who you are, whether that pleases some people or displeases, I'm not, I'm not saying you go through life trying to displease people. Um, but uh, I was talking to some people last night about choices they're trying to make with their children, and, and I encourage them to kind of look biblically and prayerfully and get some counsel and I, to take some steps that I think you ought to take. But, but then what I said to them was this. I said, look, you're good people. You're good people. I've known you a long time. You're good people. You're going to listen to the Lord. The main thing you do is this, is don't listen to anybody else and do what you believe is right for your children, not what someone else thinks is right for your children. And where you send your kids to school or whether you homeschool, like we got some parents in our church that are homeschoolers. And I know sometimes when you hear about people as homeschoolers, you go, oh, homeschoolers. You got good friends down here. They homeschool their kids, does it? That's not for everybody. Everybody shouldn't homeschool their kids. I mean, I know some of you. You should not homeschool your kids. You're dumb as a box of rocks. You couldn't teach that kid anything. Your kid's not going to stand a chance. <laughs> There's a reason we didn't homeschool my son. He just barely made it into college now. Imagine if I was in charge of that. In other words. So homeschooling is not for everybody. But here's what I believe that every homeschooling parent has come to, and that is this, is I can't worry about what everybody else is thinking or doing. i got to do what's right for me and for my family. And in that, there's, now listen to me. I didn't mean to talk about homeschooling. Listen to me. If you're going to be a homeschooling parent, but the whole time you're homeschooling, all you're doing is watching Facebook to see what people say about you because you're homeschooling, you shouldn't be homeschooling. I'm just telling you. you you got to let go and say, look, I'm, this is who we are. I don't have to explain that to anybody. I don't have to justify that to anybody. I don't have to rationalize that to anybody. You're doing what you want to do with your kids. I'm doing what I want to do with my kids. I love the way you're shouting now. I just... That's true of everything, how you discipline your kids, how you raise your kids. As long as it's biblical, as long as it's sound, your kids are not everybody else's kids. And you can't be worrying about what other people think about your kids. I mean, we want people to think we got nice kids and they're doing great things. Right, Bella? She give me the thumbs up, my friend. Uh, you got to know who you are. I think the last slide I gave you last week was uh, knowing or understanding why you are is discovering your purpose. Knowing or understanding who you are is embracing your personality. Uh, it, it's right before slide, the, the point number two, so if you're looking for it up there. Uh, knowing or understanding what you are is admitting your character. And uh, again, I said I wasn't going to teach on it. It's in your notes. It's in the outline. Uh, that is the why, the who, and the what of life. <laughs> knowing or understanding 
why you are is discovering your, oh, this is why God made me this way. This is my personality strength. That's my, I was shaped, I was shaped this way and formed this way while I was still in my mother's womb. God made me this way. I have a rather outspoken uh, kind of personality. Uh, that didn't happen. I di that didn't happen when I was 32. I didn't suddenly come out of my shell. If you talked to me when I was eight, I was a pretty outspoken. This is what got me in trouble most of my life. Can you? I know some of you are shocked by that. Like, what? Does, when I got in trouble, it was for this right here. I'd get in trouble in school and uh, but I tell you what I was good at, can you, can you can still see this in my preaching sometimes, is that I could say things with this, and then when my parents would get to the school, I could sit in the room with the teacher, and they would say, what did he say? And I would say, I'll tell you what I said. This is what I said. And I would say exactly what I said. And my dad would look and say, well, why is that? I don't, I don't understand what this big meaning is about. And the teacher would say, that's not how he said it in class. <laughs> it's not what he said, it's how he said it. I'd be like... Dad, it's because I'm a Christian. <laughs> They're persecuting me. Um, uh, listen, I, uh, God wants to shave off the rough edges, and I, I believe in adjustment and I believe in modification, but I don't believe that God wants to suddenly, I don't, when you, I don't believe when you get saved, God wants to take who you are and make you into a completely different person. I, I believe in the process of modification. I, I did a series years ago. Remember the old days when you tuned your radio? <laughs> I think that's what God has to do with us. It's not, you know, I'm going to make you, and I know we're new creatures in Christ. But God gave you your personality. If you're a shy, reclusive kind of individual, I don't think you ought to get saved and think you're going to be Billy Graham. It would be foolish. God's just going to take your quiet, shy personality. He's going to tweak it a little bit. If you're shy and you're quiet because you lack some self-esteem and some self-worth, he's going to tweak that a little bit so you find out who you are in Christ. But he's not going to make you this loud, outspoken. You're not going to be another Mark Evans. You're going to be who you are. And you got the more comfortable you are in that. Guess what you have in life? Less stress. I'm, I'm not trying to please everybody. I'm trying to please the Lord. Uh, identification. You got to know who you are. I got six emails last week because I said, "Look, I don't agree with everything he says, but if you want to see this in somebody blatantly and boldly, it, it's in our own president. It's in President Trump." You don't have to agree with everything he says, but here's what I'm going to tell you. There's n you could never, ever watch that. I watched a woman being interviewed the other night who is actually, she just put her name in that. It doesn't matter who she is. But my wife and I watched her in a 12-minute interview, and they asked her. I went back. I recorded. I went, I went back. They asked her 16 questions. She never answered one of them. She, spoke, she was very good. She was very eloquent. She was very intelligent. But when you looked, and it was as if you said, well, that's the question in black and white, and then you listen to her, you know, 60-second, minute-and-a-half explanation, when you look, you're like, well, but that never answered that question. Uh, now, uh, here's what I'm going to tell you. You may not like the answer, and I'm not here, I'm not, I'm not telling you, you know, he's my guy, I'm just, I'm just telling you. You cannot watch President Trump and leave thinking, I don't know what he really thinks about anything. I, I'm, not, I'm not sure, you know, he's a little sketchy on what he really wants here, you know what I mean? Uh, no, he's blunt, he's bold, he's, in fact, he's rude, he's brash, you know, he's outspoken. You know, why? I'll tell you why. He's securing himself. He, he's not trying to impress you, he's not trying to impress anybody. He believes he is the smartest guy in the room. And he's not always, no one is, no one's ever always the smartest guy in the room. They keep bringing people in, they keep bringing us. <laughs> Sooner or later, you're not the smartest guy in the room. The only time you're the guy, smartest guy in the room, I was the smartest guy in the room once, in the seventh grade, when you stay back four times, you're eventually, like they're going over stuff and you're like, oh, I got this. I got my notes from last year. I got this. I'm getting an A on this test. I got. So, it, you know, there are moments, but in normally in life. So I, I'm not using him tonight. I hope I haven't offended anybody. I'm not using him to say, I think he's great. I think he's fabulous. I'm just saying, in other words, uh, he doesn't, like you and I sit and worry about, oh, if I say that, you know, someone will think this. And if I say that, I might offend this group. And if I say that, then these people won't be with me. And you listen to politicians. That's their whole conversation pattern. How can I answer this so that what I've done when I'm done is everybody still likes me? I don't know how you sleep at night. I'd be like, I'd be freaking out. Does everybody love me? Does everybody like me? Everybody? Sometimes you just got to say what you say and tell the truth and shame the devil. That's my mother. My dad's a little less spiritual. My dad says, let the chips fall where they may be. But anyway. <laughs> <laughs>
And I ain't talking about potato chips. But anyway, uh, identification. Got to know who you are. Say amen. amen. Number two, dedication. Know who it is you want to please. You want to get rid of some stress in your life? Figure out who it is you really want to please. I am able, Jesus, this is Jesus speaking. He says, I am able to do nothing from myself independently of my own accord but only as I am taught by God and as I get his orders. Even as I hear, I judge, and then I decide as I am bidden to decide. As the voice comes to me, so I give a decision. And my judgment is right, just, righteous, because I do not seek or consult my own will. I have no desire to do what is pleasing to myself, my own aim, my own purpose, but only the will and pleasure of the Father who has sent me. Man, you can get rid of a lot of stress in your life. Uh, are we doing the right thing? Are we going in the right direction? I'm just, I'm just doing what God's asked me to do. I'm just, I'm just going to be and try and do to the best of my ability. I'm not, I'm not Jesus, so I'm not going to hit it out of the park 100% every time. But you know what? I'm going to hit some nice base hits, and maybe every once in a while I'll hit a home run. But I'll tell you, we're going to score some runs. I'm going to win the game of life. Why? Because I'm just going to try and please God. And, and I'm just going to try and do what he wants me to do. And this sounds, look, you know, we can all, I'm saying tonight, I'm shaking my head and I'm saying amen. Dude, can I tell you, as human beings, this is hard stuff for us to do. It's, it's great to sit in church and add our amen and fill in the blank. I know who I dedicate. I know who I want to please. But it's hard when you're in the middle of an argument with your wife to stop and think in the middle of that anger, hold on, I want to please Jesus more than I want to win this argument. I want to please God who saved me more than I do conquer in this moment. And so how do I adjust what it is I'm saying so that I please him and not myself? I, I could win this argument. I'm, I'm good at this. I, I could win this. I could, roll, I could steamroll over this. No, I, I don't want to do what I want to do. I, I want to do what he wants me to do. Now listen, you can't please everyone. <laughs> Even God can't. I mean, so don't beat yourself up. This is why you shouldn't stress over it and try to do it with every living fiber of your being. As you can't please everyone, even God can't. Just about the time you get crowd A happy, crowd B will get upset with you. Trust me. Say something outspoken on Facebook. Say something outspoken in real life. You know, it's, it, 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 people that 10 minutes ago were on your team. Oof, oh. Shoo, they come right at you. And I was like, whoa, wait a second. Listen, Jesus never let the fear of rejection manipulate him. And again, this is, it's easy for me to say that out loud, and it's easy to tell you that, hey, man, I believe this, and Mark Evans, I try to do this all the time. It, it ain't easy. It's hard. I love me some me, and I love it when people love me. I would much rather be liked than disliked. I would much rather go on my Facebook page and see 400 people have commented, and they agree with what I've said instead of, they want to disagree and argue with you about something. I, I, I get agita, I get turmoil, I get, why? Because we want to be liked. In us. But I, I'm just going to, no one can press you without permission, so you just got to stop giving people permission. I, I'm, I can't live my life for you, I have to live my life for God. And so I know who I am in Christ, and I, I'm not saying I'm perfect, but I'm doing the best I can, so I know who I am. And my, the purpose of my life is that I'm dedicated uh, because I know who it is I want to please. Leonard Ravenhill, who's a name you should write down if you're a young Christian uh, and you don't know who Leonard Ravenhill is. Um, there are very few people that I would tell you you could read anything you want from Leonard Ravenhill and you won't go wrong. Um, now, you won't like much of it. <laughs> Leonard Ravenhill was one of uh, the last generation's prophets. He was a prophet. Uh, and so his message is oftentimes harsh and uh, challenging. Um, but he said this, if we displease God, does it even matter who we please? Catch that for Tony. Catch it for him. It's fresh, buddy. I never even opened it. It's all yours, my friend. That's holy water. It's been up here. That's holy water. Yeah, it is. Really, I prayed over it before. I prayed all the hell out of it. So it's holy water. It's good for you, man. Uh, Leonard Ravenhill said, uh, if we displease God, does it matter whom we please? If we please him, does it matter whom we displease? 
in the end equation of life, if, if you get before God and you, God says, wow, you put, well done, thou good and faithful servant. I, I want to hear that. I don't want to hear, man, Mark, you were such a people pleaser. Come on in. You made so many people happy in the kingdom. Oh, Mark, Mark, come, get over here in this. You never offended anyone line. Get, get over here in this line with these six other people. You, these people over here never offended anyone. <laughs> uh, uh, listen, you cannot live, that was Leonard Ravenhill. I, I'm no Leonard Ravenhill, but, but here's the way I worded it. Listen, you cannot live to please everybody, but we must, and you and I must live to please one, God Almighty. So here's what you got to try to do. Listen, love God, love others, mind your mind, guard your steps, protect your heart, reject sin, embrace correction, seek holiness, and I promise you, you will one day hear heaven's applause. God will say, well done. You're not perfect, but you know what? You sought holiness, you embraced correction, you rejected sin, you protected your own heart, and you kept your mind focused on the right things. And, I, and here's what I believe, and it, like I said, it's taken me, I'm 60 years old, it's taken me most of my adult life to figure this out. Once you dedicate yourself to a purpose bigger than yourself and you know who it is that you want to please, a lot of the other stuff in life just, just falls away. You get a lot, lot less stress. How did Jesus have so little stress in his life? I'll tell you why. Because he knew who he was and he was comfortable in who he was. He said, I am the way. You've you got to remember who he was saying that to when he said it to <laughs> He was talking to a whole bunch of people who thought they knew the way. So what was he telling them? You're wrong. When he said to them, I am the light, that they thought they had the light. Well, wait a second. What about our light? That's no good, that light anymore. The batteries went out in that. <laughs> it's pretty dim, and they're going to put me on a cross in a couple of days, and when they do, that's all going to be over. And three days later, he rose from the dead, and the Bible says, and the veil was torn. I don't know. A veil was this intensely heavy and thick, gorgeous curtain that surrounded the front of the Holy of Holies. There was the outer court, the inner court, and the Holy of Holies. And all, the priest only went into that inner court, and into that Holy of Holies, once a year. Think about it. Once a year the guy went in with some blood in a bowl. And it took him all day to get ready. It took days, but it took him all day to get ready. They had to wash him a certain way in his clothes, and it had to be perfect and uh, they, they had bells around the bottom of his robe, not because he wanted to sound fancy, but because sometimes when they would go in, if they made one mistake, one mistake, like they were supposed to shave this and they didn't shave it. They were supposed to wash this and they didn't wash it. That, that kind of mistake. They made one mistake in his garment. It was wrong. When he went in, the Bible says he would die in the presence of God. Why? Because in the Holy of Holies, the mercy seat was there, the Ark of the Covenant, the presence of God, and God's a holy God. God can't tolerate sin. Anything out of order, God can't tolerate it. And so if he went in, he would die. And, the, and so they would put bells around his, his, uh, his robe and, and a rope around his ankle, a, a cord. And, and if he died, because <laughs> like if you were the associate pastor, like, like I'm the associate pastor, so my dad goes in and he dies, he keels over. Do you hear the bells? I don't hear any bells. There's no more jingle in those. Dad's gone. Okay, Mark, you got to go in again. I ain't going in there. You've got to be kidding me. If they killed him, they're definitely going to kill me. I, God's going to, I, I, I. They pull the rope, pull him out. And the Bible says that when, when Christ rose, that veil was torn. I don't know if God did it or an angel did it, knows, but I, I, I just stuck his finger in the top and it went like that. No more. We now come into the very presence of the living God. Jesus wasn't ashamed of who he was. I'm the way. I'm the light. He was comfortable in who he was. Got rid of a lot of stress in his life. He knew who it was he wanted to please. Thirdly, you got to organize. It's about organization. Organization means that you have to set clear goals. Jesus answered, even if I do testify on my, on my own behalf, my testimony is true and reliable and valid. For I know where I came from and I know where I'm going. But you do not know where I come from or where I'm going. <laughs> said, you guys don't know nothing. I know everything, and I'm focused. I, I have the sense of organization about his ministry. There was a sense of clear goals. Jesus had a clear, he wasn't like wandering, like, oh, I don't know, where do you want to go tomorrow? I don't know. 
Now, see, like you never read like Jesus with his disciples like, I don't know, where do you guys want to go tomorrow? Anybody feel like, I heard they got a good snack bar up at Samaria, you want to go? I heard they got a new food truck over in, you know. Everywhere he goes, he's, I, I've got to go here. I must go through Samaria. I, I've got to meet this woman. At a, you don't know it because you don't know anything. I know. I know who I am. I know where I'm going. And, and I know where I came from. And I know I've got to meet a woman at a well. And I know I've got to win her over. I've got to talk to her about her relationship with God. And I, I, I know where I'm going. He, he had this sense of organization and clear set goals. Listen, preparation prevents pressure but procrastination produces it. Say that six times fast tomorrow. Preparation prevents pressure, but procrastination produces it. You and I work by either priorities or pressure. That's how we work in life. Oh, I got to get that done today. Listen, when, when you're saying things like, oh, I got to get that done today. I'm behind the eight ball. Ooh, you, you better take a look at your life. I mean, we all, I understand, life does that sometimes. Things happen unavoidably. But if you're constantly a person of, oh, I'm up against the clock, I'm rushing, I can't, you know, someone said to you, hey, can you have lunch today? No, I can't stop for a minute. And that's your life all the time. Uh, two things are happening. Either you're not organized or you've taken on too much. You, you, you've taken on too much. You, you own, you're trying to do everything. You're owning too much, in other words. So, uh, uh, listen, organizing is what you do before you do something. Oh, I wish I'd given you just that. You should really write that down. It's very, very clever. Organizing is what you do before you do something. So that when you do something, it's not all messed up and you're less stressed out. Organization isn't about perfection. It's about efficiency. It's about reducing stress and clutter, saving time and money, and improving the overall quality of your life. Listen, the more you organize, the less you will agonize. Um, there are certain professions, and, and I'm going to use a simple one uh, because uh, it always intrigues me. When you get a good painter, a good house painter, a good painter, um, it always amazes me the amount of time that painters take to set up to do a job. And then they paint the room in 45 minutes. But they're there all day. But, but a lot of it was preparation. They were getting things ready for that. And, and look, in your line of work, in other words, whatever it is that you do, in other words, you could be a food service guy. So in other words, you know, it looks easy when you're on the truck. My friend, Super Duper Weenie over there. It looks easy when you're on the truck and you're handing out hot dogs. But what people don't see is how early you were up in the morning to make sure that the hot dogs were ready and that Mark hadn't eaten them all from the last job you did. And... <laughs> Uh, and, and, and people don't see the preparation that goes into that moment of production. Um, you know, people show up here on a Sunday morning sometimes. They think, wow, you know, what a job. I wish I only worked on Sundays. And they, don't, they don't see the preparation, because people rarely see the preparation. Um, but when painters, I'm always intrigued with painters. They, they show up, in other words, and they, they take all morning. They're taping off with that blue tape, and they're taping off things, and they, the drop cloths, and the paints, and they go out to the truck, and then they come back, and, and then they have a coffee break. And, uh, <laughs> and then all of a sudden, bam, they paint the room. You go outside, you go outside five minutes, come back, the room's painted. You're like, wow! It takes you days to paint the room. They do it in... And I've talked to a bunch of painters. They tell you, look, and sheetrock guys and tapers, carpenters, all the same. It's the preparation that makes the work easy. The job looks easy when you get the right preparation. That's and that's true if you're in a corporate setting and you're, you're in a big meeting those, and you get up and you give that 15, 20 minute you know, speech with the images on the screen and you, you know, oh, wow, I one, everybody thinks, wow, that was great. Knows. What they don't know is that you spent six months putting that material together in those. Uh, organizing is what you do before you do something. Uh, Jesus had this clear sense of organization about his ministry. Uh, he had 12 guys. Three of them were the inner team. Uh, the other guys were some. One guy had the assignment of the money. He picked the wrong guy there, but anyway, he knew what he was doing. Uh, 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 it's all organized, in other words. There's, not, there's, no, there's no rush. There's no chaos in the ministry of Christ. Now, there are in his disciples. There's chaos in their lives all the time. They're out in a boat, and they're like, Jesus, we're dying. And as he comes walking on the water, hey, guys, how you doing? You go home and read that. I, 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 I think it's Luke's guy. I, you'll find it. But go find the story where Jesus comes walking to them on the water. Just Google it. Jesus walks to them on the water. It's an interesting story because Jesus actually sends them in the boat. It says he goes up in the hill top to pray, and he sends them to go to the other side. He says, and I'll meet you on the other side. He, 
I don't know how, you know, they never asked, well, how are you getting there? So, I've been there. It's a big piece of water. And I was, I, I, you know, it's a, it's a long trip to the other side. Uh, and he says, you know, I'll meet you on the other side. You go. And, I was, and of course, you know, halfway across, and I was, there's a storm comes. And then Jesus is walking on the water. And they see him. They think it's a ghost. Ah, they freak out. Because, you know, when our life is a mess, we oftentimes panic. But Jesus doesn't panic. Uh, but it's, it's an interesting, there's an interesting wrinkle in the story. Go, go read it when you go home tonight. Here's what it says. And it, it, they see him and he call, they call out to him. But it says, and Jesus would have passed by them. He wasn't coming for them. He wasn't in a panic. What was Jesus? He was on task. He was focused. He said, I'll meet you on the other side. Now, here's what I believe. I believe that, yes, the story came up because I think the devil was trying to kill them and trying to destroy what it was that Jesus was doing. But here's what I believe is they either could have prayed or they could have worked a little harder and not panicked. They would have got to where they were supposed to get and Jesus would have met them. But he wasn't in a panic. Jesus was still focused. And we always read that story like, oh, he came to them in the boat to rescue them. But you read it. It says, and he would have gone past them. Notice he wasn't coming for them. He was going where he... <laughs> I told you guys they're going to meet you over there. What are you freaking out about? I, I told you this is where I would meet you. A lot of times we panic. Jesus isn't panicked. He's not stressed. Why? Because he knows who he is. He knows who he's trying to please. And there's a sense of organization in his life. The more organized we are, the less you panic. Uh, number four. Uh, concentration. Concentration. This goes with focus, with, with organization, but let me just talk to you for one minute about concentration. Focus on one thing at a time. And when daybreak came, he left Peter's house and went into an isolated desert place, and the people looked for him until they came up to him and tried to prevent him from leaving them. But he said to them, I must preach the good news, the gospel of the kingdom, to the other cities and towns also, for I was sent for this purpose. Uh, it, here he is again with this sense of organization, knows who he is, knows what he's doing, knows who it is he's trying to please. Now he's got a whole group of people that, no, 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 they're groupies. No, please stay here. We love you. Stay with us. Like, I would have stayed. I'm like, I'm a, those people over there might not like me. Over here, they love me. I'm staying right here. He said, no, I, I, I know what I got to do, and, and I'm concentrated. I'm focused on one thing at a time. I'm not very spiritual, so let me just give you one of my favorite uh, little quotes that I use lots of times. It's not very spiritual, but my grandfather taught it to me. Listen, you can't chase two rabbits at the same time. You just, does that make sense? <laughs> you just can't chase two rabbits at the same time. Jesus knew how to handle interruptions without being distracted from his primary goal. And I think sometimes as Christians, what we do is we, we rush through life. We're, you know, we're, like, we're like my dog in the backyard. My dog was out today in the backyard, and he's, rah, 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 he barks at this and that. And then a leaf, I don't know where it came from, and all this frozen tundra, but a leaf you know, had broken free from something or other, and it was blowing across the top of the little icy backyard. You know? And man, my dog just went, you know, like, and he's doing what he's doing out there. But that, it was, I tried calling him. I'm like, rugby, no, don't go over there. Distracted by what? By a stupid leaf. <laughs> and he chased it all the way down. He grabbed it. <laughs> Mouthful of leaf, you know. Yeah, I think he like. I, I don't think he can talk. Do you think your dog can talk? I think sometimes my dog looks at me like he can talk. He bit that leaf, and I, I could. I swear, I could almost see over his head like a little bubble. The thought. I thought this was a potato chip. You know, that's. I look. That's what I thought. I was like, <laughs> I was like just like all brown in his mouth, and he looked at me like what? Like you couldn't have told me? Like you know. I thought this was a potato chip. I'm like, you know, stay focused, buddy. Stay focused. Listen, the combination of confidence and hunger will always create concentration. I'm giving you a little biblical stuff here and a little some business stuff. So, but you can apply it in both areas of your life. Listen, the combination of confidence and hunger will always create concentration. I, I'm, I'm hungry, I want more, I, but I'm confident. I know who I am, I know who I'm trying to please, and I want you to take the spiritual application of this, but I, you're all smart enough to understand you can take this message and you can apply this to your business life, to your marriage. You, you can apply this in a whole bunch of other places. You can make this work for you in other places. If I want to be successful at work, it, I might be a little more successful if I am confident in who I am and I'm not trying to be what somebody else wants me to be and I'm comfortable in my own skin at work, so I'm not trying to impress people, I'm just trying to be me. That's probably more attractive than me trying to fake it and be somebody else. 
or do somebody else's job. I'm just going to be me. I'm going to do what I know to do, and I'm going to do it well. Uh, and then I'm going to have organization. I'm going to have clear goals. I know who it is I want to please. In the spiritual realm, that's God. At work, that's your boss. In marriage, that's your spouse. See how easy this is? This works. I've got to please my boss. Oh, he's a jerk. He's still your boss. He's the guy that signs your paycheck. We've all worked for idiots. <laughs> Just me? I'm the, anybody working at New Life, don't raise your hand. If you raise your hand, I'll... <laughs> my dad is sitting right down here. He will hit you with his cane afterwards. Um, uh, can I just give you one more thing about uh, focus and concentration? Um, and you really should take a picture of this. You could use this at work or use it at one of your staff meetings or something or other. Listen, creativity is the search for options. Concentration is the elimination of them. You have to begin to understand the difference uh, in your spiritual life and in your business life. Uh, creative. A lot of times we think people are we, we think people are concentrating when they're being creative. And, and uh, I'm not against creativity in this, but uh, listen, I could sit around and talk for hours about all the dreams and things I want to create. Ninety nine percent of them will never come to pass. Why? Because we're just being creative. We're dreaming. We're we're just shooting stuff. We're we're spitballing. We're sticking, throwing stuff at the wall and sees what sticks. Uh, there's a vast difference between creativity and concentration. Uh, because here's what concentration does. Concentration is the elimination of the things that you thought about that were creative. Just, am I, some of you still look puzzled. What, so if you sit around and you're creative and you say, look, we're in debt uh, and we want to get out of our credit card debt. So how creative could we be about getting out of debt? And so you make a list of all the things you could do. We could sell stuff on eBay. We could have a tax sale. We could get another job. We could borrow money. We could consolidate our debts. We could talk to our banker. We could take the financial peace class at church. What's that? That's being creative. Concentration is when you sit down and you say, okay, I could take a second job. No, wait. I'm already working 60 hours a week, and I never see the kids, and uh, I, don't, I don't really think that's a viable option. What do you think? I mean, what, do you, and you, what does concentration do? It eliminates that. That option's gone. So concentration is not just about, people think concentration is about dreaming about things. It isn't. To me, concentration is about getting rid of everything that's unimportant, and that helps me focus on what is important. I'm going to concentrate on who it is God has called me to be, told me to do, and I'm focused on that. And I'm going to organize that, and I'm going to make that my goal. Say amen. amen. Number five, Jesus is brilliant at this. Um, and it's all through Scripture. It's not just Jesus, but he's brilliant at it. Listen, delegation. Delegation. Don't try to do everything yourself. One of the reasons you're stressed is because you think the world revolves around you. One of the reasons you're stressed is because you're carrying the weight of the whole world, the whole family. Um, now listen, don't, don't all chuckle out loud. If you ever find yourself saying things like, you know what, if I don't do this, nobody does it. You have a problem. The problem is, is you don't know how to delegate. You can't let go of things. Why? Because you, you believe what you just said, that if you don't do this, it's not going to get done. And I get it, I, I get it. And, and, and maybe you do, and maybe I've said it too, and maybe it's because we get a lot of stuff done. But if you're constantly saying that, it says more about you than it does the people around you. You need to get different people around. Maybe the people around you can't do it. Well, then get rid of them and get somebody that can. Sometimes you have to do that. It's hard. It's painful. You should try doing it in a church. It's hard to fire people in a church. Well, how do you fire somebody? We're Christians, you know. You're fired. You can't say that to people. You have to say things like, I believe the Lord is releasing you. <laughs> into a new area of ministry. What is that? You just got fired in a church. That's what happened. Uh, and he appointed 12 to continue to be with him that he might send them out to preach as apostles or special messengers. Jesus knew what his goal was. Jesus knew what his agenda was. Jesus knew who he was going to please. But here's what Jesus also knew. I'm not going to be here for long. I mean, this is like short-term stuff. I'm not going to be here for 10 years. I'm not going to, I don't have 20 years. So if this thing is going to last beyond what I do at Calvary, I'm going to have to figure out how to delegate and let this go to other people. And I'm just telling you, if you want to release some tension from your life, figure out how to let some other people do some stuff. Now, if you're a perfectionist, this will be hard. If you are an outspoken person, this will be hard because you want to drive the boat. You want to drive the car. 
because you're comfortable in that seat. But, but you have to let go sometimes. Uh, we get tense when we feel that somehow it all depends on us. Uh, I've already told you, Jesus enlisted 12 disciples. Don't allow perfectionism or the, fears that, or the fear that others may even do a better job uh, keep you from involving others. There, there are two main reasons we don't do it. Is one, we don't think people are competent. And two, we're afraid someone might do it better than we're doing it. But listen, th- again, this is where this whole stress thing comes from. See, if you're comfortable in who you are, and someone does something that you used to do and they do it better than you, you're not uncomfortable in that. Why? Because you've moved on to something else. You're growing, they're growing, everybody's growing. Amen? It's like, it's, you know, some people, as John Maxwell says, you know, some people, they never share an idea, they never share the glory, they never share the credit. And the reason why is because in their whole life, they've only ever had two good ideas. <laughs> You know, if you've only ever had two good ideas, I wouldn't share them either. I mean, if I only ever did two things good, I ain't sharing that. I only got two. He says, you know, what you have to learn is, is that you've got a great idea and you've got a great thought. Let someone else run with it. Let someone else do it. Let someone else get the glory. I said on Facebook a couple weeks ago, it is amazing what you can accomplish for the kingdom if you don't worry who gets the credit. It's, it's all about the kingdom. It's all about God. Uh, and that's true at work, too. Now, I, don't, I get it in work, as you shouldn't. You shouldn't let people take credit for things you've done and them get advancement and you don't. No, that's just foolishness. But, but, but don't live every moment of, I've got to get all the credit, I've got to get all the credit. No, it'll, it'll come out, don't worry, it all levels out. People know. People above you know. They're, that's the reason they're above you. <laughs> it always amazes me when people want to explain to me you know, why they're doing what they're doing, and you have to kind of back them up sometimes and say, stop. You're explaining to me what I already know. I'm up here. You're, still, you're trying to get up here. I already know what's going on. You, you need to tell me about that other person or why these things are. I know. I'm up here. I'm watching it. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about that. You worry about you and, and see what God will do. Amen? I, I didn't put it in your notes, but you, you should write this down. Remember the 70-20-10 rule. 70-20-10. It's not hard. 70-20, that's 90, and 10 is 10. Um, and, and listen, don't come to me after and say, Pastor, in my life it's 68 and a quarter and 11 and a half. No, I'm going to have to slap you if you come to me with that nonsense, all right? So I'm rounding out about, okay? So here, but here's what, here's what every person in, in management or leadership in the world will tell you is, is that 70% of what most of us do as human beings, 70% of what you do, anybody could do. 70% of what you do, anybody could do. Oh, I got to get there early. I got to order the things. Anybody could do that. I know you do it, and you do it great. And you do it the best. You're the best. You've been doing it for 30 years. You do it better than the rest. Make me feel sorry for the rest. <laughs> no one does it better. <laughs> so uh, 70% of what you do, anybody could do. 10%, uh, 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 20% of what you do, 20% of what you do, someone else could do if you gave them some training, some teaching, and a little bit of mentoring. So 20% of what you do, you could actually train somebody else to do. And I agree, they couldn't do that without you, they couldn't do it without your knowledge, they couldn't do it without your expertise, you'd have to give them of your time, your energy, but you could train somebody to pick up 20% of what you do. And here's what they tell you in management is this, is that 10% of what you do, nobody else can do. About 10% of your life, of what you do in work, uh, or in different areas of your life. 10% of what you do, that, that's what it is you're getting paid for. It's that 10%. That's what you're doing that nobody else can do. Um, and, and, and that will never change. You know, there's, there's 10% of what we always do that I, no one else, no one does this better than me, and no one ever else will. So, you, listen, delegating doesn't mean passing off work you don't enjoy. That's what some people think delegating is. <laughs> oh, I hate that. I'm going to give that to him. That's not delegating. That's laziness. That's shifting responsibility. Big difference. Delegating is, is, is trusting people beneath you to do things that you do well, but you're going to show them how to do it. Um, uh, so it, delegating doesn't mean passing off work you don't enjoy or don't, or, 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 or don't even want to do, but it allow, it's allowing your team, your employees, your family members to stretch their skills and their judgment. Now listen. It will require the willingness to pay or suffer for short-term failure in order to gain gain some long-term competency. In other words, if you start to take some of your 70% and a big chunk of your 20% and say, how can I 
bless this employee and how can I bring him up or her? How can I mentor her and how can I give her some of this responsibility? And how can I free myself up from that? I enjoy it, but how could I free myself up from that, which means I'd be able to do that. Why? Because <laughs> I know who I am and I'm organized and I'm focused and um, I'm, I know that I need to stop focusing on that because God's growing me into this. And if I keep doing that, how am I going to do that? Um, this has been a process that we've been through as a church over the last uh, six or seven years. Um, six years ago, uh, we sat in some staff meetings and we challenged ourselves. I was leading the meetings, but we challenged ourselves to ask ourselves a question. Are we the staff? Are we the staff that could pastor a church of a thousand people? We were about 680, almost 700 people. We were hitting 700 and coming back down. And we hit 700, we come back down. Um, and so we asked the question in some pretty tense moments in some of our staff meetings. Uh, and the question we asked was, are we the staff that could pastor the church of a thousand people? And we had questionnaires and things we could fill in. And pretty much everybody, myself included, uh, you know, you always want to answer yes. You know what I mean? Oh, yes, you know, with God's help. You know? <laughs> so we all got excited about that. Um, and then I kind of pulled the rug out from everybody and said, we're not. How do I know we're not? Because we're not. Because there's only 700 people in church. There's not 1,000 people. If we were the staff that could pastor 1,000 people, there would be 1,000 people here. Because life raises to the level of who we are and what we are. So I said the only way to change our church is we need God to move. We need the Holy Spirit. I get all that. But if we begin to change as a staff, if we challenge ourselves, and we can grow, and we can start to delegate. And there are things that, and it was, look, this was super hard for me. Uh, but there were things that I did and I thought, no, uh, no one else can do that. I mean, goofy things, just stupid things that I thought, you know, no one else could do. So like, I, I don't, 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 I'm not, you know, please don't cry for me, Argentina. I'm not, I'm not weeping here. Uh, I'm just telling you, you know, so I, I do a lot of stuff. You know, so, uh, but I, here's what I actually believed. I actually thought, well, you know, I can't stop writing Sila because, you know, I got 6,000 people to read Sila, so I got to read Sila. I got to do that every day. I can't stop doing that. No, but today... And some of you are aware of this, some of you aren't. But in other words, uh, Luke does those two days a week. So two days a week, Luke does that. So I still do three. I like doing it, so I still do three, but he does two. Um, now, I read his on the days he's on. I read them. I know they're his right away. I'm like, they're not quite as good as mine. You know? <laughs> of course they're not. He's 35. I'm 60. Relax. It's a, I'm confident in who I am. Here's what I believe. I believe if you're 60, you know more than a 35-year-old. Oh, that's arrogant. I'm just, that's just life. In other words. So um, I'm not saying his are bad, but what I'm telling you is this, is that the other part of delegating that you have to let go of is, is you have to let go of things when people do it at about 80 to 85% of, of the level or competency that you are doing it at. Because they're never, ever, I, I listen, I don't care what you ever let go of, no one's ever going to, in your estimation, no one's ever going to do it at 100%. No one's ever going to be as good as you. So I, I don't care if you're making hot dogs. I'm sorry to pick on your hot dog, friend. I, I don't care if you're making hot dogs. Here, here's what I believe about you. I think you think you make the best, and you do. Your truck's much better than those other trucks, and your, your hot dogs are better than your brother's or anybody's. No, you're the man. No, you can, that's the best hot dog in it. But could he, with a little bit of training, and could he get somebody to make a hot dog about 90% as good as his? And would it ruin the business, and would it turn people? No. But it's, it's hard to let go of those things. <laughs> his wife's like, preach to him, Mark. Tell him, tell him, tell him. Uh, it, it's hard to let go of these things. So I, the, biggest, the biggest problem we had in our church staff, the biggest problem we had was me. It wasn't them. The person who had to change the most was me, not them. Now, they all had to step up. They, they're all doing more than they ever did before. And I don't give them a dime more. They're still making nothing, these people. <laughs> What's like, again, this isn't about paying. It's about growing you. I'm good at that whole pitch. You know, I'm going to grow you. Are we get more money. You won't need more money. You'll have such a sense of fulfillment. <laughs> it, it requires willingness on your part and on your family's part, uh, on your company's part to pay and suffer some short-term failures. You have to let people fail. You have to let them try. And, and here's what we lose sight of sometimes as leaders, as dads, as husbands, is this, is that we messed up. 
you know, you can't make everything perfect. No, I look sometimes, and I don't mean to pick on Luke here tonight, but I look at Luke, and I look at him and his life and his marriage and everything else. I said, told you on Sunday he's never come and talked to me about you know, his wife or anything negative like that at all. But I look sometimes, and I'm like, oh, i got to talk to him. I could fix that. You know, he, I could stop the curve. I could fix that for him. My wife's like, stop, leave him alone. How do you think we got to where we are? You made a mistake. You figured it out. You got better. Let him make his mistakes. And I said, yeah, but he already made one this week. I can't have two. And I know I'm just. <laughs> it, it requires a willingness to say, you know what, I'm going to. Do you think Jesus was a little frustrated when he came down the side of the mountain after spending all this time with these guys, all this energy, all this input, all that he's done? I said, Come on, guys, guys, I'm breaking bread. We're feeding thousands. I'm like, look at this. And he comes down the mountainside and <laughs> there's a guy standing there saying, I brought my kid to your guys. They can't do nothing with him. And Jesus walks over and says, Be gone, thou unclean spirit. And he casts the demon out. And his disciples, you know, later on the way back to the suburban, uh, <laughs> they're, they're saying, how come, we can't, how come we can't cast out that guy? How come we can't? And Jesus has to teach them again. This kind goeth forth only by much prayer and fasting. What happened? They failed. But read the words of Jesus. He doesn't rebuke them. He doesn't send them back to a conference. He corrects the problem, those, but he encourages them to what? This is how you do it next time. This kind goeth forth only by prayer and fasting. They failed. They, they messed up. He's there to help them, pick it up, let's move on. We all make mistakes. Even me. We all make mistakes. But, but God won't cast us aside, and we shouldn't cast aside other people. Amen? Amen. I really thought I was going to finish, because I only got two left. But I'll figure out something or other. We'll, we'll fudge it a little bit next week. Maybe I'll talk to you a little bit more about how we've changed as a staff and how we've let go of certain things and, and how that focus shifts and how it changes the church and how it's perceived by the church. You know, there are some things that we do very, very differently. Uh, for 25 years, if you wanted to see me, if you wanted to make an appointment to see me, you could make an appointment to see me. And it was relatively easy to get to see me. You know why? Because I would see people anywhere, anytime, day or night. Uh, and I was working, like I said, so you know, the church kept growing and growing and growing. We got to a certain level, and here's what we decided. It wasn't my total decision, but here's what we decided is we'll never get to 1,000 or 1,200 if Mark has to see everybody and fix everybody with a problem. So here's what we need to do. We need to train other people on how to do that, and to some degree we need to limit Mark's availability so, no, I know some of you have been upset sometimes when you call the office. Poor Patty, she has to deal with it all. Can I see the pastor? Absolutely, we'd love to have a meeting. Set up a meeting with Pastor Mark. Um, Monday night at 8 o'clock, I'm free. I'll be done with supper and the boys' basketball, so can, I, can he meet me Monday night at 8? No. I don't see people Monday night at 8 o'clock. I'm home trying to make out. I, I, I'm going to get a hot dog. I, 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 I got stuff to do, in other words. I, I, you know, I've worked nine hours that day, in other words. So, no, now there are certain hours that if people want to come and see me, these are the hours that, they, that I'm available. And most people, you know, they work that around. We've had some people, oh, I'm going to another church. I, I, it, it's always interesting to me because, okay, those are my hours. But we have, like I said, we got three or four other pastors now that we've trained to handle some of those things. In this. And so they'll, they'll tell people, well, Pastor Mark is really booked up, so you can't see him for two weeks. He doesn't have an opening for two weeks. You can't, get to, you can't even get an appointment for two weeks to see me. I wouldn't bother. I wouldn't wait two weeks to see a vet. I, <laughs> and, but people are on the phone with like, no, it's an emergency. i got to see him. Okay, well, we have two other pastors. One could see you tomorrow and one could see you on Tuesday. No, I don't want to see them. So, see, it tells you something about that person, in other words, that do they really want help or do they really they want to talk to me? And I'm not the guy with the I don't know. I don't know why you want to see me anyway. I have very few answers. I, re I really don't. Most people I see, I look at them, I go, wow, man, what a mess. I, I wouldn't touch that with a 10-foot pole. I don't know how to fix that. We better get somebody in here who knows what they're doing. I, you, you have to let go. You've got to delegate. You get too much stress in your life, it might be because you've taken on too much stuff. Stop. Let someone else do it. Someone will get it. They'll get it. They won't get it right right away, but they'll get it. Trust them. Amen. All right, I'm rambling. Father, bless these people.
I thank you for their patience, for their diligence to your house. God, we've talked tonight, and some of what we've talked about has had almost like a business application, but uh, I know, Father, that these people are wise enough and uh, astute enough to understand that these are spiritual principles that we can apply to every area of our lives. First and foremost, they should be a spiritual application. That if we are confident in who we are, we will stop worrying about what the devil says about us, what other people may think about us, what we even think about ourselves. We will begin to believe we are who we are in Christ. And that will give us a sense of confidence and less stress. And because of that, we can focus we know it's you we want to please, and that's why these people are here tonight, God. They're not, they're not here to please me. They're not here to please anybody on earth. They're here to please you. So honor them for that, God, and move majestically, magnificently, and wonderfully in their lives. We ask your blessing again upon our friend Babu as he leaves, travels tomorrow all the way to India. God, just watch over him. Godspeed and God's protection over his life and his ministry while he's there. Use him for your glory, Father. In Jesus' name, we pray. God bless you. God love you.